Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Drew sent me a note and said, Steve, I got a quick question for you. It can be summarized in one sentence, although he used more than one sentence to ask it because he explained why he wanted to know. But what is a hostile witness? What is a hostile witness? So if you watch a lot of TV, uh, TV shows, you may have seen a, an attorney turn to the judge and go, Your Honor, this witness is hostile. I ask they be treated as such. What does that mean and what does the treatment become? Did they, did they go rabid in the witness box? What, what's hostile mean? And so I'm going to let you know that, that the easiest way to understand this is to simply look at the rule that describes it. And that's uh, Federal Rule 611, 611. So there's rules, and Michigan has Michigan court rules and Michigan rules of evidence, uh, which parallel the federal rules quite closely. But the federal rules are applied in the federal courts across America. And so 611 talks about witnesses and presenting evidence. Witnesses and presenting evidence. And so there's a rule that explains how witnesses will testify and, and how evidence is presented. And it is designed to let the judges know what they should do and what they should not do. And the interesting thing about this is it says, A, the court should exercise reasonable control over the mode and order of examining witnesses and presenting evidence. You'll notice this is the court should. It doesn't say the court must, but... I think it's basically saying that some of these rules do allow a little wiggle room, and that's up to the discretion of the judge. So it says, so as to make those procedures effective for determining the truth. Number one goal of witnesses and evidence is to help the court, whether it's a bench trial or a jury, to help them determine the truth. That's job number one, determine the truth. Number two, avoid wasting time. So let's get to the truth, but let's not spend all day getting there if we can do it a little faster. Three, protect witnesses from harassment or undue embarrassment. And then it says scope of cross-examination. And I'm going to get there because uh, hostile witnesses comes up later, but it's interesting because it says cross-examination should not go beyond the subject matter of the direct and matters affecting the witness's credibility. Court may allow inquiry into additional matters as if on direct. And so a lot of people think, especially those who don't just a little bit about the law, but not enough, they'll say, hey, um, the cross cannot exceed the direct. So if I ask three questions on the direct and I sit down, a lot of people go, well, that means you get three questions on cross. No, 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 no. So let's suppose that a witness got in the stand and I did the direct examination. What is your name? You tell us your name. On July 13th, where were you? Standing on the corner. Did you see the car accident? Yes. Did you see who had the green light? Yes. The car accident was caused by the defendant. Four questions, four answers. On cross-examination, the person can get up there and ask them about their name, if that matters, can ask them about where they were on July 13th, because that obviously does matter, because that's when the accident occurred. They can ask them about whether they saw the accident, because that's what they were asked. And then they can also be asked about who had the green light. So you go, okay, Steve, that means you get four and they get four. No, 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 no. Because it says here you can also ask questions affecting the witness's credibility. You wore glasses? You didn't have your glasses on that day, did you? You weren't wearing your glasses. So how far were you from the intersection? You were 300 feet from the intersection without your glasses on? By the way, what time of day was this? Oh, it was nighttime. What was the weather like that day? Nobody asked about the weather on direct. Not an example I gave. But you can ask all these questions. You can always ask the foundational questions. And you can always ask about the credibility questions. Okay? Foundational questions are the ones that go to whether or not a witness is competent to testify what they're testifying about. So just the fact that they were someplace and saw something, I can dig into. Well, where exactly were they? What were the conditions like? What did they see? You know, did they make statements to somebody else contradicting what they're saying right now? Let's suppose that uh, I can pull out a piece of paper and go, um, did you speak to the police that day? You did, didn't you? And, and you know the police were taking notes of what you said, right? And did you know a police report got filed that day? Um, have you read the police report? 
Oh, you have. Okay. Did you notice in the police report where it says, I'm sorry, officer, I wasn't looking. I didn't see. <laughs> Did you see that? That's in the report, right? So isn't it true that you told the police officer, I didn't see, I wasn't looking? Did, isn't that true? <laughs> you say, no, it wasn't true. That's not, that's not, no, I didn't say that. Oh, so the police officer is, do, do you think he's making this up? Was there someone else talking to him? Was he confused? Were there other people there? Because the police report lists you as the only witness outside of the cars. You know, so there's always these things you can ask about, but that's on cross-examination. So leading questions. And by the way, a lot of people misunderstand this, including lawyers. I've seen lawyers object to a question that was not leading. Go, Your Honor, that's leading. And I've seen a judge go, sustained. <laughs> a leading question is one that actually gives you the answer in the question. Isn't it true? Isn't it true that you went to the bank on July 13th and withdrew $100? Well, if the answer to that is no, <laughs> you're going to really wonder what the lawyer's getting at because a lot of people notice that the lawyers ask a lot of questions they know the answers to. And they know that because they phrase the questions in such a way that they're that leading. And so everyone who hears that question knows what the answer is. Now, the witness can say, no, that's not true. That's not true. But a good attorney is going to go, oh, oh, I'm sorry. You did not withdraw $100 in person from that bank on July 13th? You did not. Your Honor, I'd like to move for the admission, uh, or I, I want to show a video first, um, and uh, we've, we've talked about this between counsel, and they know what I'm going to show here. I want to show a video to the witness to refresh their recollection to see if they remember something. And um, I'm going to show you now a video. Do you recognize what's in this video? Yes, that's the lobby to the bank. And the date stamp is July 13th. Okay, you see that? Okay. I'm going to play this for a second until somebody walks into frame. I'm going to freeze it. Okay, isn't that you in that video? Isn't that you in the video? Oh, yes, that's me. A minute ago, I asked you if you went into the bank to withdraw $100. You said you did not go to the bank that day. Uh, are you saying that you went to the bank but didn't withdraw $100, or you didn't go to the bank at all, or you're now remembering that you went to the bank? Remember you went to the bank. Okay. But you didn't withdraw $100? Okay. Play. Person walks up the counter, fills out a thing, hands over, up, freeze. Okay. Teller's handing you money. Do you remember that? Okay. Teller just handed you $100, didn't she? And see, the questions are phrased in such a way that everyone knows what the answer ought to be. She handed you $100, didn't she? That's a leading question. To ask what did the teller hand you is not a leading question. It is not a leading question. And so I've seen people who get caught up in this, who think that, well, leading questions are bad, so I'll go the exact opposite way. And they'll ask questions such as, what happened next? What happened next? What happened next? And that gets really, really boring. And so on direct examination, you're not supposed to use leading questions. On cross-examination, you can. So leading questions should not be used on direct examination except as necessary to develop the witness's testimony. So sometimes as a preliminary matter, you can ask questions that appear to be leading. What's your name? What do you do for a living? But those technically aren't leading. What's your name? That does not suggest the question. Your name is Steve Leto, isn't it? That's a leading question. What is your name is not leading. That is not a leading question. But it says, um, ordinarily... The court should allow leading questions on cross-examination and when a party calls a hostile witness, an adverse party, or a witness identified with an adverse party. So I am plaintiff's counsel and revolved in a car accident case, so there's a defense counsel and a defendant over there. If I decide to call the defendant in my case in chief, I can. And once they're on the stand, I can ask leading questions all day long, like I'm cross-examining cross them, even though they're my witness. And I've seen somebody go, Your Honor, he's cross-examining his own witness. And you go, Your Honor, I've called a party that's a hostile witness, or at least an adverse party. And they're identified as an adverse party because they're identified with an adverse party. 
Rule 611. The judge will look at the other side and go, of course it's their own witness, but it's the other side. Okay? But a hostile witness is not defined here. And that's not defined because they presume that you know what it means. <laughs> I should end the video right now. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, a hostile witness is one you call, not identified with the other party, and not the other party. And for whatever reason, they don't want to be there. They don't want to be there. They don't want to answer your questions. So you ask them a question like, um, you, you call them your case in chief, right? And they're not an adverse party. And you say, uh, where were you on July 13th? Uh, it's, it's a whole day. I, I don't know. I was all over the place. Well, did you ever find yourself at the intersection of such and such and such and such and uh, where there's a car accident? Um, can you be more specific? I don't know. I don't know. And that might not seem that troubling, but somebody who is giving you a hard time on every single question is going to get you into the situation where you are wasting time, which you'll recall was number two in the considerations regarding witnesses. Number one, determine the truth. Number two, avoid wasting time. So you get a witness up there who's giving you one word answers that aren't really appropriate. They are pretending to not know what you're talking about. They are just wasting time. And, Your Honor, I would ask for permission this time to treat this witness as a hostile witness. And the court grants that, and I've seen it done before. I've seen it done fairly recently in a couple well televised or in a couple well publicized um, trials. That you can then shift gears, Muncie Rock Crusher, and you can, <laughs> you can go into cross examination mode. So you called them, they are your witness in your case in chief, and you tried using the non leading questions. It didn't work. They were trying to combat you. So you have them declared a hostile witness. Now you can say, isn't it true that on June 13th, approximately 4.15 in the afternoon, you were standing at the intersection of 4th and Main, and you saw a car accident at that time, didn't you? And if they say yes, you say, okay, and you move on. If they say no, you may have to back up that question and say, well, on June 13th at 4.15 p.m., were you at that intersection? And they again say no. Now you pull out whatever it is, such as the police report, and say, well, I've got a police report in my hand. Have you seen this? And uh, it lists you as a witness, doesn't it? And the police report says that the accident occurred at 4.15 on July 13th. And um, according to the police report, you were standing near the corner. Are you saying that statement's not true? Now, I know some of you want to be going to see this. Hearsay, it's hearsay. Uh, it's not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, but <laughs> hearsay is not just another video. It'd be another series of videos. The point is that there are witnesses who don't want to testify. And so getting answers out of them that are narrative in nature will be like pulling teeth. And so a court can allow you to treat them as hostile. And all that means is you go from asking the normal open-ended questions you normally ask on direct examination, and you can shift gears and ask them the leading questions that you normally do on a cross-examination. And if you've seen it done well, it's, a, it's an art. It's an art form. And I've seen some attorneys who are very, very good at it. And it doesn't have to be hostile in the nature that most people use that word. But it just simply means that the mode of questioning is going to change. And it gives the attorney more leeway to make up for the fact that the witness is uncooperative. That's what it means to be a hostile witness. And the attorney would have to ask the court to so declare the witness. And the court will usually see what's going on and not argue with it. Now, I've seen it before where an attorney who was not doing a very good job asked a couple bad questions and got a couple bad answers back and said, Your Honor, I'd like to treat this witness as hostile. And I've seen the other side object and a judge deny that by saying, um, you're just not asking the right questions. 
And this is unrelated to that, but I'm going to have to tell you this because you might say, Steve, what's a bad question? I'm just talking about where the attorney doesn't get it. And I had a deposition once, and depositions are where you get to ask a witness questions under oath, but not in court, in front of a court reporter, and they're under oath. So, you know, it can be used later in court as testimony. And my client was being deposed, and so we all went to an office and sat in a conference room as a court reporter, and me and my client, and my opposing attorney and her client. And at the very, very beginning of the deposition, she asks my client, you know, do you have a driver's license? And he goes, yes, I do. She goes, can I see it? He goes, I don't have it on me. And she goes, oh, well, how'd you get here today? And he goes, I drove. She goes, do you always uh, carry your driver's license when you drive? He says, yes. She goes, well, I'm going to repeat my question. Can I see your driver's license? He says, I don't have it on me. Now, I'm not making this up. It went like that for about five minutes. And she kept asking more and more specific questions about, do you ever drive without a driver's license? No. So every time you drive a car, you have a driver's license with you? Yes. You drove here today? Yes. Can I see your driver's license? I don't have it on me. And exasperated, she turned to me and she said, Steve, your client's messing with me. And I don't remember this is on the record or not. I did not get a copy of the transcript. I should have because it was one of the funniest things I ever saw. I was laughing inside, but I had my poker face on. And she goes, Steve, your client's messing with me. And I said, no. And the court reporter's giggling. And this opposing counsel is getting very, very upset. And she goes, Steve, where's his driver's license? And I said, don't ask me, ask him. Where is your driver's license? Out in my car, in the parking lot. <laughs> it's been there the entire time. For whatever reason, attorneys will sometimes get so tunnel visioned on the question you're asking that they don't back up and look at the bigger picture and ask themselves if they're going in the right direction. And so when you ask the question, did you drive here today? Yes. Do you always have a driver's license with you when you drive? Yes. Do you have your driver's license on you right now? No. Where is it? That's the obvious next question. But you jump ahead to, let me see it. Don't have it on me. Next question. Where is it? No. <laughs> did you drive here today? <laughs> And it was like watching one of those stupid loops that happens when you poorly program something in basic back in a day when people were doing that. <laughs> I'm talking about taking classes on programming things in basic and you put a loop in there, just sits there and does this. And you step back and go, why is it doing that? Because you told it to, okay? <laughs> just, but the thing is that a human being should have the ability to step back and go, what's going on here? So... If an attorney is asking good questions and the witness is trying to weasel out of them for whatever reason, you can then ask the court to declare the witness hostile. And all it means is at that moment in time, you can use leading questions, which normally should not be used on direct examination. That's all it does. So it's not a bad thing in that sense. It's not like it's going to be a scarlet letter. It's not going to you know, in, in, you know, impact what, what tax rate you pay. All it's going to do is mean that the attorney that you were just messing with now gets to mess with you. And so, like I said before, I've seen some attorneys who are so good at cross-examination, I wouldn't want to be declared a hostile witness with them. But I'm not often a witness in court either, so there you go. <laughs> but Drew, thanks for sending the question. In case you want to look up the rule, that's 611 on witnesses and presenting evidence, and that's what a hostile witness is. Questions or comments, put them below. Those will talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. The only difference between a good and a bad haircut is about three weeks.